You're now watching the Danny Mac Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Welcome back into the Danny Mac Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. We get you Hall of Famers on a regular basis, and it is not limited to Canton, Ohio. Toronto, Ontario has a Hall of Fame, too. And former Blackhawk Jeremy Roenick finally is going in. He's with me today. JR, congratulations. 12 years of waiting. Finally done. You can exhale now that the tears have dried. Way to go, man. It's it's crazy, Danny, right? But, uh, yeah, it's been 12 long years. And I have to say I was frustrated for the longest time, and I didn't think it would mean as much as it, getting, as it did getting that call. But it really sent me into a tailspin, man. I cried. I, I screamed. I, I, I felt so uh, elated and um, – just relieved. And I I will say waiting definitely builds up the anticipation and builds up the emotion. And it was an amazing day on Tuesday and it's just been a whirlwind ever since. I mean, it's, um, I I don't, I still don't think it's really hit me yet. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the phone's been ringing off the hook texts and everything. There's no hook anymore. It's all digital Mac. Um, (laughs) anybody call you that was a surprise? You said, wow, that's, that's cool. Yeah, and Justin Verlander FaceTimed me, and he nice. was all excited. I'm like, that's awesome. That's fantastic. Ray Bork um, FaceTimed me right before I was sitting down for dinner. Wayne Gretzky called me this morning. I mean, it was just – it's just one after another. It's, it's, it's amazing to see the camaraderie in hockey and people I haven't talked to in years and years and years. Coaches of mine from the past, Ron Wilson, Todd McClellan, Tim Hunter uh, – you know, it, Paul Holmgren, I can't even tell you how many people that I literally haven't talked to in 20 years have uh, popped up and, and been kind enough to send their congratulations. And, my, and I'm so gra- grateful for it. You made an impression on a lot of people. It doesn't surprise me. And in a lot of cities, as I was, you know, combing the Internet yesterday, every town you played in is claiming you. Ex-Flyer Ronick to the hall. Ex-Shark Ronick <laughs> to the hall. Everybody wants you now, man. That must feel good. Yeah, it really does. And it, 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 it shows I played a long time. You know, five teams for – like the only team that's not going to claim me is the Kings because I had one year there. It was terrible. They're going to say, yeah, we don't, we don't want him a part of the Kings. <laughs> um, but, it, um, yeah, I was very, very fortunate. I played with five great teams, five great jerseys, five great fan bases – and uh, I couldn't be more more proud and honored. And um, the good thing is, all five of my jerseys will be will be presented in the Hall of Fame, you know, in my booth. And that's that's what's important, not just one. You know, a lot of my buddies who don't really dig hockey asked me yesterday, "Is it like baseball? Does he go in as a guy from one team?" And I said, "I don't think that's how it works. But if it if it were, he'd go in as a Blackhawk, the team that drafted him in 1988. Is that would that be accurate?" Well, I think. I think that's would be correct and would be probably proper. Uh, I played eight years, nine years, my glorified years with the Hawks, the, the, the team that drafted me, that took their their chance on me at 18. I scored 50 goals. I'm still the last Blackhawk to score 50 goals, believe it or not, in, back in 1992, 93, which is crazy to think about. Only three Blackhawks in history have scored 50. So I had a great – Great connection with Flyer fans, too. I just didn't play there long enough. I played there three seasons. The fourth season was a lockout, and then I got traded for the fifth season. So um, only it's only proper, it's only right to be in a Blackhawk uniform because, again, they were the team that drafted me. I do know the numbers pretty well. Um, you know, as a guy who's been watching it a long time and reading about it, studying it, and talking to the guys, Bobby Hull did it five times, the 50 goals. Al Secord. Tough guy, Al did it, and you did it twice. That is, you know, Savvy never did it. Stan never did it. You know, Kaner never got there. That's, I, I, I guess to win three cups without that is a good thing, but it's still, it's like, all right, who's the next guy to give Chicago a real rush as a sniper and a goal scorer? We haven't had one of those. Well, I think we, I think, yeah, but I think we see it right now with Connor Bedard. I mean, he's, this kid is a goal scorer. He's a shooter. Uh, I will predict in his career in Chicago, he will be the fourth person to hit 50 goals and, and, and do that feat. The kid is absolutely amazing. Um, It's going to take a little while for the Hawks to get to that level. Obviously rebuilding a team is very difficult, but um, you know, 
it, you always ask that question. Obviously, Bobby Hall and myself are two ones that guys people get quick. But Al Secord, you know, not <laughs> nobody gets that one. And that's how good Sav. That's how good Savvy he was. Is Al Secord played with Savvy that year, and all he had to do was go to the net, and Savvy put it right on the stick, and the things in the back of the net. Plus, Al Secord had a shot that would go through the net. Um, <laughs> so it was a pretty cool guy. Pretty cool guy uh, to be associated with. Looking at your numbers the other day. <laughs> A hundred points three years in a row. Uh, something that really impresses me is the great availability. Um, that should be a player's number one ability is his availability. You played in 75 or more games, 12 of your first 14 years. Um, and that had to be difficult. How, how much do you pay for it today? Uh, I don't know if you <laughs> took shots to play JR or if you played when you shouldn't have more than you did, um, but uh, it would stand a reason your body is beaten up pretty bad. Well, the answer is yes on uh, the first two. I did take shots. Obviously, I had broken bones, especially in the playoffs. It was needles galore to try to play. Um, I did play when I wasn't supposed to, obviously getting concussions. Um, back in the day, I would play no matter how bad the concussion was. I remember getting knocked out in Minnesota and not really losing 20 minutes of my life not knowing – where I was, how I got in the locker room and everything, and literally playing the next day against Minnesota and Chicago and got a hat trick. So, uh, but that was just the way he did it. And you played hard because you didn't want to lose your job. You played, you played hurt because you didn't want to lose your job. Um, you needed the money. You didn't want to be sent to the minors. You didn't want someone to come up and take your, your spot because you were injured. And, you know, my body is actually pretty good right now, to tell you the truth. I, I've kept up on it. I work out all the time. Uh, I've been blessed with a very durable body. Uh, I did get stem cell uh, stem cell uh, procedures done. So I can still squat 300. I can still hit a golf ball. I can still – the only thing I can't do is run on a treadmill. I can't do that. Why would you want to? You can't keep the ice cubes in the glass. Exactly. The yeah, no thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, well headline in, the headline in the Toronto Sun – uh, controversial Ronick surprise pick to the hall. And I'm like, okay, um, am I going to get a lesson from lefty here? And I didn't, the writer actually came right out of the gate and said what a lot of us would like to say. The committee chose skill over the noise outside these walls. Um, has it bothered you that some people still keep you at an arm's length for the NBC incident five years ago now? No, it doesn't bother me anymore. Um, I know the real truth. I know the real me. I know, I know what, you know, what their uh, incentive was. Um, and unfortunately I got caught in a, in a time when people were trying to make their mark and people were trying to have influence. And there's certain people that I did not get along with that had it in for me and that's okay. Um, I'm, by the way, I'm just fine. I have I have four business I have four businesses. I work for a great company. I just got inducted to the Hall of Fame. Um, I live in San Diego, California, right near the beach. My life is just fine. So all those people that try to uh, put harm on me have failed, and I am a better person for the bad things that I did, or the bad things I said, or the controversial things that I did, or the controversial things that I said. But you know what? It, I was me. I was real. I wasn't fake. I didn't. I didn't give any cliched answers. And you know what? Unfortunately, in today's world, people don't like truth. They don't like it. They don't want to hear it, and that's too bad. They want to hear their version of it, and anything else they shove to the side. I wouldn't agree with the adjective controversial. Uh, I'm a word guy, man. I would say outspoken. I would say colorful. I would say effusive. I wouldn't say controversial. Well, I mean, when I told the fans to kiss my ass during the during the 2004 lockout, um, because they were blame that because people in the media were blaming the players for not playing when it was the owners that locked us out. Um, it wasn't us. So, I mean, that was controversial uh, when I when I told the NHL to wake up because the refereeing was so bad and I was sliced up like a you know, like a, like a pig on my face, all cuts and scars and, 
and stitches everywhere and no penalties are called. I mean, that was controversial. I mean, there's, you know, I threw a water bottle at the ref. That was controversial. Okay. All right. So you're reminding me of some things. Yeah. You're, 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 yeah. you're embracing yeah. it. You're not, you're steering right into it. Aren't you? Hey, listen, it's my life. You know, I can't hide from it. And, um, I'm not, you know, I'm ashamed. I don't want to say I'm ashamed of things, but I definitely would have altered, um, a lot of, uh, maybe things that I said or how I said it or how I acted now that I'm 54 and 14 years out of the game. Um, yeah, I, I, you learn as you get older, right? And you watch and you see, and um, I'm definitely a better person today than I was 20 years ago. Uh, more humble, more, um, I think, gra- gra- um, grateful, but still, I still love my career. I saw something you said about the last four months of your life being very different. Uh, and a lot of, I, I'm paraphrasing, a lot of soul searching. I, I don't know if the guys on the teleconference followed that up. What did you mean by that? Well, I think it's, you know, you, you follow your life and what you do, right? You, th- you see the things that, you're, um, that you can handle, things that you can't, unmanageability. Um, I've, I found myself away from home too much, um, out drinking a lot, um, gambling a lot, doing a lot of things that were detrimental to me. Um, and it was it was hurting my relationships. It was hurting my relationship with my family, uh, with some of my friends. Um, you know, when you're not present and not uh, paying attention to the things that you should be paying attention to, uh, life passes you by and you miss out on a lot of things. And I had to uh, kind of reorganize my life and reorganize what was important, um, get rid of certain characteristics that were probably not not great for me. And it's 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 been very very good it's cleared my mind it's cleared my heart and um I, i'm present i'm way more present where i am right now i'm getting a lot more done i think my relationships are stronger and since you know since i kind of took that mentality like really good things have been happening to me and just culminated with you know the call from the hall the other day are you off booze uh, let's just say I let's just say I pick and choose very very um, very wisely. Um, I don't drink during the week. I don't drink drink during the week. I have a glass of wine with my wife or somebody for dinner in the weekends. But the uh, the partying and the drinking and the out in the bars, getting drunk and all that stuff is is behind me. I don't do that anymore. All right, um, you know, because I was wondering, and and I've been in a program three times. Um, Some things will never change. Hopefully, even though I smoke weed and have the occasional drink, I don't forfeit the wisdom I got in counseling. Um, Yeah, it does. It does. You know, your perspective does change as as you get older and the, the focus becomes a lot clearer when we don't use as much or drink as much. Uh, anything you wish you could have done differently in Chicago, looking back at it. Well, for sure, what got me traded is the relationship that I had with with Mr. Words, um, the the conversation that we had on a new contract that I was trying to get in 1996. I mean, it got to be a he said, she said, uh, kind of a word battle and a battle of, of the powers. Right. So I was the I was the powerful hockey player that had all the chips in his corner. And Bill Wirtz was the owner of his team that didn't want to go along with the salary uh, escalation that was happening at the time. And, you know, I think I, I let my voice uh, get too too rowdy and to the wrong person. And, you know, that ended up being my demise in Chicago. But it could have been handled different differently by them also. Um, I'll take a lot of the responsibility, but um, we're both at fault for my departure in 1996, which really which really was uh, probably the, the biggest uh, black stain on my on my career. Mm hmm. As it was for the Hawks as well, uh, Jamnoff didn't work out. They paid him a lot of money, and two years later, they had a four-year stretch where they didn't make the playoffs. And as far as insults go, that's pretty good, not making the playoffs in, in the NHL. <laughs> well, you know, they, so, somebody once told me that, um, that the consequences for actions. Um, but the way I look at it, they traded me in 96 – uh, they started on a downhill trend. They missed the playoffs for four or five years. Uh, they couldn't put anybody in the stands. They had five or six, 7,000 people in the building. They ended up being last place in the league. And what happens when you get to the last place in the league, you get high draft picks. They got Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taves. Changed the whole mentality of that, of that organization. 
Rocky Wirtz took over and really gave the, the team back to the fans. He did an amazing job of uh, treating the players correctly and right and brought back some old Hawks that uh, allowed the, the PR to really um, perform uh, off the ice with, with their ambassador program. And they won three cups. So all's good in, in, in Blackhawkville. And now it's going to do that again with, uh, with Connor Bedard. I sure hope so. And I, I did forget about him a few minutes ago. A man after he got hurt, I kind of I kind of went away. I was a bad hockey fan this summer. I might as well be working on the air in Chicago, still full time, <laughs> not watching hockey. Uh, I heard Silverman. Yeah, I know he's your guy, and you're his guy. You're everybody's guy. But he says we'll have to get a hold of Jr. sometime. Down, get a hold of him. Call him now. God damn it! What are you waiting for? <laughs> you, 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 Cubs and Sox are last place teams much of this summer yet. Dick, these guys yeah. just don't speak. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody has a, a Jeremy Roenick story they like to tell, and I'm sure you tire of hearing them. And I don't know if you have a favorite goal or a favorite moment, but I'll share mine with you. Um, it wasn't even your rookie year. You you didn't even have enough games to be considered a rookie in '88 and '89. It was a lousy year. Mike Keenan's first with the Hawks, 27 wins only on the year. I was at the rink all the time, practices, games, whatnot. And on the road in St. Louis in the Norris Finals, when Glenn Featherstone knocks your teeth out with his stick and you skate to the official and you say, what's this good for with blood dripping out of your mouth? And then you score the power play goal and you guys punched yeah. out the blues. That that's that that's the moment I said to Roman Madrowski, who's a longtime buddy hockey guy I said, man, I'm so glad this kid's on our side. <laughs> well, that was uh, that kind of was my coming out party. And I say that because really I'd never gotten any stitches or any broken bones or by, by the way, um, broken teeth. And I got 25 stitches in the nose in the first period of that game, then got my, all my front teeth knocked out by Glenn Featherstone and showed him to Kerry Frazier, the referee, which ended up. And then after the game scoring the winning goal, I'm sitting in the locker room with the biggest smile on my face, this, this skinny scrawny kid with his face absolutely mangled and no teeth and a smile. And I think people are like, holy cow, this kid is happy after just getting his ass kicked on the ice. And it kind of became a, it kind of became my persona, right? Play through pain, play through anything. And that's, that was kind of the shining moment. Uh, JR, last thing I, I want to ask you, uh, give me uh, give Hawks fans listening uh, a message you would like to pass along to them. The, the people who still wear those 27 jerseys yeah. and, and not for Daryl Sutter or Johnny Oduya. But for the kid from Thayer Academy, one of the best American-born players ever, what would you like to say to Blackhawks fans or any any teammates, ex-teammates who might be listening or watching? Well, I think every kid grows up uh, with a dream to play a pro sport. Um, I grew up to, to dream to play hockey. And not knowing what was going to happen, and when I got drafted in 1988, I got drafted to an original six team. And not only an original six team, to one of the greatest cities in the world. And Chicago is one of those greatest cities in the world. So much so that I'm there pretty much every other week. Um, every time I go back, I am welcomed with open arms. Uh, there's not too often I don't that I pay for a drink in a bar. Uh, not too often I don't go without getting an autograph or saying hi or somebody saying something very nice. So my relationship with the with Hawks fans is immense. It is strong. It has never wavered. And people still today talk about 96 trade. And what it would have been like if I would have stayed my whole career. So my passion, my loyalty, my thank, my thankfulness, my gratitude, and um, and my loyalty to the Hawks fans is second to none. And uh, my teammates also, Chris Chelios, obviously Steve Larmer, Michelle Goulet, Eddie Belfour. I can go on and on about teammates. But Chicago fans are the most unbelievable, most passionate, and one of the, one of the most caring fans ever. And they treat me so well. So for that, I say thank you. Thanks for eight great years and uh, all the years after. You you have been one of the, probably the most accessible superstar since I've been in Chicago media in 85. There have been some good ones, but I don't think anybody did more than you. And, and graciously, too, thanking fans. You're a genuine dude. And uh, cheers, whether it's a vodka on the rocks or a, an O'Doul's, JR. And uh, have That's a great good. weekend. And <laughs> maybe I'll drag... Line. 
Uh, uh, yeah, I'll make. I'll drag my ass to Toronto, and uh, we'll put on some rush and uh, and and hoist one then in November. Thanks for the visit, man. I love it. Thank you very much, man. Appreciate it. Jeremy Ronick going to the Hockey Hall of Fame in November. Uh, November eleventh, I believe. Pavel Dotsuk, Shea Weber, a couple of ladies going in this year. I should make the trip for the first time. I want to thank Randy Merkin, who gets a, all of our great guests on the podcast. Sam Michael is my executive producer. And Adam Delavitt runs the show at Bet Rivers. I'll be back with more NFL next week. Thanks for listening and thanks for watching.